word from this video sponsor. Got an idea for a circuit, widget, or device that you want a rapid prototype or sell? Check out JLC PCB. They offer their board manufacturing services starting at 2 bucks for 5 boards and only take a few days from start to finish. So make sure to check out JLC PCB. And once again, thanks for making this video possible. Now let's get on with the video. Hey there YouTube, this is SGM4306 back with another video. And as if you could guess, uh, this is another project video. Um, boards provided by and sponsored by JLC PCB. Now let's just get right into it. So I have opened this up before uh, just to see the boards. And um, I got a set of these VFD tubes. And um, these are vacuum uh, fluorescent displays they glow kind of that greenish blue color and they're really cool of a technology and they don't require like very high voltages only like about I think 30 volts if it's non multiplexed if it's multiplexed that might increase to like 50 to 60 uh, depending on the size of the tube but this is a very small tube and um, this guy is an IV21 the one sort of getting um, rubbed off there but yeah you can see this was made the third week of 1987 so this is actually a year older than i am <laughs> anyway i soldered one of these up and so the two boards that i got i'll show you one of each um these guys and um so i designed this this just takes all the pins and brings them out to a 0.1 inch header uh, which i then proceeded to solder to a right angle connector so it can just plug right into a board and here's the actual controller board itself. And you can see it fits right in there. So it just holds the tube above the board. And um, yeah, so I soldered this up. Um, this was not really that interesting to watch. It was just going through. So I, I didn't really bother filming this. Anyway, um, we I just uh, designed this board to actually interface with that tube and to control it. And this will work pretty much with any... Um, of this style tube they have larger ones um that have the same number of segments but they're just physically larger so theoretically this board can control any of those types of tubes um can control up to nine grids um eight segments um which is pretty standard multiplex and um this guy will be an at mega 328p um it'll have a onboard buzzer uh it'd be usb power these are the push button switches the icsp header and it has an onboard um, boost converter stage. And it takes the 5 volts from the USB and it boosts it up to the max that I actually measured from the converter. Under no load, of course, is I think it was about 120 volts it can generate from 5 volts, which is kind of ridiculous in terms of the boost ratio. Uh, but under load, that sags down to like 70 or 80 volts. So I, I think, yeah, somewhere around there, like 80 or so. Um, but anyway, this tube, even with multiplexing, I don't expect it to draw more than like 40 or 50 volts. Um, so we'll be running it at slightly lower duty. Anyway, there's a boost converter that's controlled by the, um, the microprocessor. And that's uh, switching at um, 62 and a half kilohertz, something like that. The microcontroller is uh, 60 megahertz clocked. Um, using a crystal, my standard uh, DS1302 RTC is there, um, as well as battery backup. The filament is um, uh, lit current limited by this resistor, and it's actually uh, software switchable uh, via this transistor, and then the microcontroller can turn that on and off. So uh, basically the idea was to make this generalized enough so that I can add software to turn on and off the display at will, and can do a whole bunch of other neat stuff. Um, the blanking is software controlled as well, so it can actually pulse with modulate the brightness of the display as well as modulating the um, the drive voltage. Um, there is currently no feedback, so it runs the boost converter open loop, um, and it's just pre-calibrated in software. So that's not ideal, but I could easily in the future use one of the analog inputs and program a very simple compensator. And finally, over here, we have the um, high voltage drive chip, which is, I believe I wrote it on there, it's a MAX 6921, and it's a 20 output um, serial input chip that you just send it the, um, the states of all 20 outputs, and it'll switch them up to a high voltage. This chip can run, I think, up to like, 
oh, I don't know, like 80 volts or something like that. Um, so that's one of the limitations in terms of how high I can switch this uh, converter so I don't blow out that chip. Anyway, um, this is all ready to go. I got the Enig, the uh, gold plating, um, and it's absolutely beautiful. This The combination of the black silk screen, it's matte, which I actually in this case really like it looks really nice with the gold plating looks absolutely amazing i'm actually thinking about um getting some um business cards uh made out of pcbs with the gold um gold plating text and like silk screen and all i think that would look really nice um anyway um this is all ready to go so we can uh just do another soldering montage solder this up and uh, plug this tube in and see uh, hopefully it works. Anyway, uh, let's get to soldering. Okay, so soldering went fairly smoothly. I can remove this. I um, assembled two of these tubes because actually I found uh, one of them has a pretty big uh, noticeable issue. The gradient across this tube is actually pretty bad. So the last digit barely lights up. I think there's something up with the uh, filaments or something. So I soldered up the second tube that I, I had and uh, this one works perfectly. It's pretty even actually the the lighting so I'm gonna use this one and this one will be relegated just for testing I guess but anyway um, this went to, together pretty well um, nothing really major with the exception of I made some small mistakes um, 
I'll have to fix in the schematic. This cap, I accidentally put, I, I meant to put it before the boost converter. I accidentally put it on the output. So it was snubbing kind of the switching output of the boost converter and obviously it wasn't working. And um, I was wondering, what the heck? I'm not getting, you know, high voltage out. And I uh, checked with the schematic and it was pretty stupid. I used the wrong power rail in the schematic. So it, it accidentally attached not to the five volts, but to uh, V out. Anyway, um, that's fine. I just cut the trace on that. Uh, so right now this cap's actually not connected to anything and it still works just fine. Um, so I'll probably just uh, bodge that onto the five volt rail uh, just to add some filtering to the input side. Other than that, uh, the blanking uh, pin on this actually wired it to um, to the MISO pin on the SPI port. Um, I actually didn't realize that um, when you're running this chip in master mode, you can't... The master output pin obviously is the data pin that, that talks in this case to this chip. Um, I'm not actually using this chip, doesn't send any data back to the AT Mega. So I was hoping I could reconfigure um, the MISO pin, which would have been the input pin going to the chip. Uh, but you can't configure that like at all. You, you can't use it as general purpose IO when you're using the SPI peripheral, uh, which is a pain. So I had to cut the trace on that. Well, actually, I didn't cut the trace. I lifted the leg and then I soldered a bodge wire over to um, A1, which was just a conveniently open pin that I could just use as a, an output to uh, switch that. So that worked out fine. Uh, I had to do some experimentation on the filament resistor. Um, the value I originally had, I think I had like, I don't know, 20 or 30 ohms, and that was way too small. And um, yeah, you could actually see the filaments glowing a little brighter than I'm comfortable with. They should be very faintly uh, glowing, like kind of a pinkish color if the lights are off, very faintly. Um, for them to actually kind of be optimal any more than that and you're just shortening the life of the tube so that was no good so I um, increased the resistance I believe it's up to uh, 80 or 100 ohms something like that um, it's good enough I, I put a dual play spot for either a quarter watt or an eighth watt surface mount so quarter watt through hole or eighth watt uh, surface mount I ended up using the um, surface mount one because I did not have any quarter watt through holes in the correct value so was it is what it is but anyway other than that um everything kind of worked um besides those two troubles there is one caveat the software isn't 100 percent operational it's about 99 percent. there's one major bug that i still need to fix and the um the little piezo uh, i originally had a series inline uh, resistor and then i thought yeah, it would probably be bad because this isn't a, actually a piezo. This is a like a electromagnetic buzzer speaker. If uh, it gets stuck on high, it could burn that out. So I put in a capacitor, a small 0.1 uh, microfarad capacitor in series. So even if it gets stuck high, um, it'll block the DC. So, And it works just fine. It sounds just as loud. So no biggie there. And other than that, everything uh, went together pretty well. So anyway... I'll show you guys first with the uh, the bad tube. Well, not really bad, but not quite as good. Um, the gradient issue, because I am DC driving the filament, uh, which isn't a great thing to do. I thought I could get away with it on a small tube like this. On large tubes, you generally see quite a bit of an issue. But anyway, we can just plug this in, and it turns on. You can see everything looks great, but the last digit is quite a bit dimmer. It looks kind of blue on screen here but it's actually more of a greenish teal color to my eyes but yeah you can see it's like almost half as bright as the other digits um so that's kind of no good in my eyes so the second one that i soldered up is um pretty even i'm pretty happy with this one and there you go it's um much more even. And um, another thing is, um, this is generating, I think I, I, I set, calibrated the, um, the high voltage generation to generate somewhere around like 40 or 50 volts. So if you touch the pins, it won't kill you. It'll give you a, a, a weird, very funny feeling tingle. Um, so I just generally try not to touch kind of this 
exact area right here. It's not going to hurt you really, but um, just good not to. Anyway, you can see the uh, clock functionality is working. Um, right now, I, I don't have a real-time clock battery, so it just defaults to some default time. Um, but you can set the time, hours and minutes, by pressing these buttons. And I have a nice little beep from the uh, speaker. Yeah, you can see everything works. AM, PM indication via this dot here. And yeah, you can see it starts counting. And there you go. This looks really nice um, just sitting there. I'm going to have to build like a clear Perspex uh, case around it, maybe acrylic, something like that. That's just a little bit larger than it because um, that'll look really cool sitting on my desk. And the digits are actually pretty small. Um, and they're not as readable. I have a um, IV18 tube, which is about, I don't know, like twice as long, maybe a little bit longer. And it's, you know, it's, it's bigger. It's quite a bit bigger. And that's visible clear across the room. This one you pretty much have, to, this is perfect for like a desk clock that you're sitting at the desk. Um, but anyway, yeah, that looks absolutely stunning. Let's yeah, get a close up of that. It really does look a lot bluer on the camera than to real life. I don't know why exactly that is, but I know you can put different color filters on these to uh, change the color of anything from like orange, yellow, white, uh, blue, green. But yeah, everything works. It's uh, keeping track of time. I left it running all day actually. And uh, compared to, you know, my other clock that I have, the time seems to be pretty accurate so far. So not too worried about that. Um, yeah. I love these old tubes. These are absolutely beautiful. Anyway, um, actually, I thought it'd be interesting to uh, measure the current as well, see how much this little tiny tube uh, sucks. So we have the uh, USB analyzer here. There we go. And you can see it's actually drawing more than my other clock. I have a, the larger IV18 tube clock that I built uh, using you know through-hole uh, prototyping board only draws, I think, a little over 100 milliamps, and this is drawing 150, <laughs> which is interesting. This draws more current, even though it's smaller. Though I might have um, biased this a little higher of a voltage so that this is brighter, actually. The other one is a bit dimmer, but I can easily compensate in software now. Um, so I might have something where if you press and hold some button combination or something, you can change the brightness or display timeout or whatever you want. So yeah, anyway, um, I'll have all the information um, up on the hackaday.io project page. Once I get that up, the link will be down below. And I'll have all the design files. I'll fix some of the problems that I've come across. I still need to fix a big bug. Let's see if you guys notice it. Yeah, you can see the top digit of the last or the top segment of the last digit is always on. Even when it's displaying a 1, it looks like a 7. And when it dis displays 4, it does, you know, it looks kind of like a 9. Uh, I have a faint sne uh, sneaking suspicion of what's going on with that. I think uh, it's either something to do with my inner digit blinking is something that's going wrong. Um, and a previous digit, maybe that's, that, that's on and it's kind of bleeding through. Or I think more than likely than not, there's some kind of bug in my code that sets that bit in the buffer for some odd reason. And I'm going to debug this a little more and track down what that is. But that's definitely, it's common between the two tubes. So it's not like the tube is damaged and that segment's like always stuck on. It's definitely something in my software. So I'm just going to spend a little more time, but I figured I might as well release this video now instead of waiting to fix that one bug and um, delaying this entire video. But yeah, um, I'll spend a little more time on the software and I'll get this all up. So if you guys want to make your own, you entirely can. But yeah, I absolutely love, and I love the little beep too. I generally don't include speakers on my clocks because I don't really care to use these as alarm clocks. Uh, though this is capable of doing that now, so I could actually have a alarm mode and um, figure out how to use your interface to set that and 
and all that. But anyway, for now, I'm happy with this just being a clock. Just got to fix that one bug and make a case for this. And this will be quite a nice clock to have sitting on my desk. Um, it doesn't draw particularly too much current as well. So I could just have this plugged into the computer at my desk at work and just running just always on USB. And that'll be fine. Anyway, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Um, if you have any questions or whatnot or any ideas, I really do want to build a lot more of these like VFD or Nixie tube clocks and stuff. They're really cool. I actually have an idea of uh, making some kind of watch out of this. So this is highly impractical and the battery life would be pretty short because even though these tubes are kind of efficient-ish, um, you know, drawing a decent amount of current while on display, you know, compared to something like maybe an OLED display might be a little bit more efficient or something, but this would be just sort of really neat, kind of steampunky of a, um, making a wristwatch out of this or something. Anyway, um, rambled on for long enough and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.